Ah, there we go. I think we're live now. Good. Good deal. So I had another idea today. Of course, it was magnificent as far as I'm concerned. I thought it was a... Uh, that was one of those wonderful kind of uh, aha moments I just wrote about. This one is about, uh, you know, exactly what all this means and where it come from. Then there'll be a little bit of reading. And again, since it's late at night, I hope it doesn't put you to sleep and kind of captures your imagination. I think this will because it caught mine tonight. <laughs> See, what we have to remember about all of this lore that we're looking at it's an attempt to answer a question. Some people don't even know that it's asked. But it, it may not be a straightforward one, is that, it, is that we're looking for an answer in all this. It may not be a straightforward one, but it is a powerful question. King Gilfie was a wise man and skilled in magic. That's how everything starts. He was much troubled that the Aesir people were so cunning that all things went according to their will. Isn't that kind of what we all want, that everything goes according to our will? He pondered whether this might proceed from their own nature, or whether the divine powers which they worshipped might ordain such things. And that right there is the entirety of this division between monotheism and paganism. The great monotheistic belief tradition centers around one thing, that the greatest part of who and what you are originates out there somewhere. And these pagan beliefs is a 180 degree from that saying that, hey, this right in here, this is what makes my world what it's supposed to be. The greatest part of who and what I am already is here. Those gifts that we're in receipt of are right here. These are the tools that I can use to create the world I want to live in. And people get confused when I say that. They get all butthurt or confused and they're walk into somebody's living room. And tell me if they haven't created the world that they want to live in. That's their resources. That's how they allocated them. That's how they live. That's the world that they live in. If they want to make it bigger. They want to expand upon it. They want to make it greater. Well, that, that opportunity is there to do it. You have those gifts. Also true is about building upon that. Also true is about utilizing those gifts to the best of our ability to become something more. Not a hate-filled retard or some kind of jackass or something, but to do not the shock value of all these things, which I'll get into, but something to be somebody worthwhile. <laughs> what happens when we stretch the boundaries of our imagination to accept this new input as Gilfie is now struggling to do? Because that's what he's doing. He's struggling to accept this newfound question that's kind of hit his mind, much like we are. His response is one of a complicated collection of atoms doing what it can to handle this new input of what we might refer to as spiritual energy. He begins his research just as we are now doing. Biologically speaking, it would seem that we adapt to new inputs of energy. In fact, all of life adapts and evolves to deal with new flows of energy across the world. Just the way it is. We see them migrate to newer, fresher, and greener pastures, and who is to say that our minds don't do the same thing when it comes to erecting new boundaries to hold the chaos at bay? Make no mistake, there are predators at the edge of our minds in this process every bit as assuredly as there are at the edge in the herd of its, in its migration. See, Gilfie is struggling to make sense of all this new input, and when he begins to describe where he ends up, this juggler with seven analances, uh, a ceiling so magnificent. I mean, this is a whole new realm for him, and he is attempting to make sense of it. So he begins to ask these questions so he might surmise how he might best fit into that world, just like we are doing. We are presented with a new, fantastic, magnificent spirituality, and we've got to make sense of that, don't we? <laughs> the questions that he asks to answer that one question something that we do now. But back to the predators and the migrations. These predators will thin the herd, so to speak. They will feast upon the old and the feeble, those thoughts that no longer do us any good, the sick and the very young, those dumb ideas that we sometimes come across. <laughs> they are not strong enough to keep up. See, those 
fads, those fashions, they don't stick around. There's no class. There's no character. There's no staying power. Your class never goes out of style. In some instances, the herd will band together to protect this fallout. More often than not, hi, Letitia. More often than not, they will take advantage of the distraction to put as much distance between them and the predator as they can. We study and understand as much of this as we are capable of through the sciences of biology and many other ologies. That's the great herds migrating. I have a huge canvas painted by a wonderful artist of the of the wildebeest migration crossing the mountains side of my river. Yet migrations happen all over the world. Anywhere there's a great plans, herds move. <laughs> At the cellular level, antibodies and cell structures, complex proteins, and the like of a strong and healthy cell will have what it takes to overcome and devour or fend off various diseases and viruses, those predators of the microscopic world. New fields of study and medicine work as if by magic, to assist and reinforce our ability to strengthen those collections of cells. Actions which seem to provide an abundance of life-saving and life-extending processes. They seem to defy our ability to answer. We can't see it. We take a pill or a treatment or some kind of shot to bypass or strengthen our own biological processes. At the cosmic level, Earth's magnetic fields Protect it from the greatest amount of energy from our very powerful sun. Complex mathematics concerning the laws of physics and emerging sciences, sciences of the electric universe theory address how these energies interact with each other in our solar system and beyond. The one who doesn't understand this interaction of the divine of these cosmic bodies we see represented in Loki's wrangling, the uninspired human intellect who doesn't understand how they all work together, and he makes ass of himself. <laughs> we explore new horizons, from the personal and spiritual, the microscopic to the universal, the process is the same. In our lore, we have that outline, answering that question, how that question is answered, it works from the personal and spiritual the microscopic to the universal, the process is the same. We evolve with question and answer. He who can question and answer well. Boo. Are we so cunning that all things now go our way, or are we still subject to the actions of the divine? That is the question which starts this entire journey. I have phrased it like this. Are we capable of greatness undreamed of, as suggested in the prose edda and the books I've written? Or does the greatest part of who and what we are still originate from outside of our being in the realm of the holy and spiritual? What if it is a combination of the two, as is suggested by the previous chapter? The current research on the brain suggests that it receives information about our interactions with this world and how we might best navigate life how we might best navigate it from our physical senses, but also from certain electromagnetic signals. Talked about that yesterday. It is, once again, a powerful analogy of exactly where we as a people are in the process of adopting this burgeoning new ideology, one based upon an input of lack at both the physical and spiritual level. Mentally and emotionally, the inputs are the same. Shallow. It's the impetus to want to change. There seems to be no energy there to motivate us. The frequencies we desire are not there, and so we begin a migration of our own. We undertake a journey every bit as profound as the one Gilfi takes. We come across sights, sounds, and people which seem to defy our current understanding of the world around us. We find that we are no longer searching the world with blinders on. We are opening our eyes in the same manner as the babe entering a new world. For we are most assuredly entering a new realm of existence, one which we have control over in ways which have heretofore been forbidden. We are actively deciding to change the spiritual foundation of who and what we are, and with that comes the responsibility of ourselves from ourselves. We are sacrificing ourselves to ourselves. You see, the idea is repeated in the lore. 
we are told the story of a spiritual evolution in more than one way so that we might get the message, so to speak. And we begin to answer, or more accurately, we find a definition in the question as to what is really going on. And that's all that I think most people are looking for. For those of us in Ossetru, or in any number of other pagan faiths for that matter, we may well discover that we are now far more accepting of things we once considered silly, or that we might have made fun of. Now that we aren't, are you having enough success in life to justify no longer finding it comical? Or have you simply found that your thinking process has now rediscovered something very holy and spiritual that deserves your utmost respect? That, my friends, is called faith. But what happens when you cannot rectify the two? And believe you me, there's a bunch of them that can't rectify the two. What happens when you cannot bring these various ideas into any meaningful framework with which to operate a new and different style of living? See, there are a number of obstacles to overcome in order for us to handle this profound change and not come out the other side looking like an idiot, like a dinner for schmucks. At first, it took me a couple of years before I went to my first get-together. It was an Ostar meeting, get-together at Evening Runestone. I met Steve McNallan there for the first time. I just really didn't want to go. I kind of had all of this new stuff going on in my head. I was very excited about what was going on. I was I was full of enthusiasm about this new idea, this new way of life. The last thing I wanted to do was to go to one of these get-togethers and it be a absolute dinner for schmucks. And I just couldn't tolerate that idea. I did not want this new thing to be. I needed it. In every sense of the word, as a being on this planet, I needed that spirituality so I might move forward. Because I promise you, I was literally at the rope's end with this stuff. With life in general. <laughs> See, that... What happens when you cannot bring these various ideas into a meaningful framework with which to operate a new and different style of living? There are a number of obstacles to overcome in order for us to handle this profound chain. And I already read that. Sorry. <laughs> and we all know what that looks like. But do you know what those folks have that a lot of other people who cannot make this connection do not have? See, there's all kinds of people out there that we would still make fun of. We would call them all kinds of names. We would look at them. They might be, you know, some Wicca person worshiping Dumast. And that literally means dumbass. I'm just going to tell you right now. Um, they have a framework which keeps the chaos they perceive as unsuitable for their life at bay. Whether you like it or agree with it or not, they've put together something in their own life that allows them to keep moving forward. Or at least not be in as much pain as they were when they made that decision to change everything. Whether or not you agree with it is irrelevant. They've got something to hold on to. Our challenge, if we want to justify our seat at the table, is to come up with those ideas that represent a pattern that might help people look like the decent kind of people we all want to be perceived as. Many of the people in the midst of this transition do not have that framework. They can't find one. Or, more importantly, they're not willing to make those sacrifices of ego to see the door. They're blind, so to speak. They look about and they see that no one is talking coherently about one. But there are plenty of people speaking with passion about hating this or opposing that. There are plenty of people who subscribe to the concept that a political system will fill the gap. And it will for a moment. And then it won't. It will fail them as assuredly as the shoddy tools Loki had commissioned to save his neck failed the gods at Ragnarok. And that's exactly the moment they fail when things are the toughest. Nobody wants to talk about that. 
they will come up with new terms to justify their position and form ever smaller groups of what they call quality people. But they won't go out on a limb. They won't go anywhere to tell the truth because they are no longer answering the primary question. He pondered whether this might proceed from their own nature or whether the divine powers which they worshipped might ordain such things. These folk are no longer even in the ballpark. They're not in the ballpark of quality determination of such difficult suppositions. They have settled. They aren't even trying. They have now become the flip side of that coin of the people that have that framework that eh, maybe whatever. I don't think so. It's not for me. I'm not going to sit around burning incense and eating mung beans, taking a bath with sage leaves and a candle and call it good. Uh, that's about the limit of where it goes. And it's the same thing on the other side of the coin. They have bypassed the self and the spirit and gone straight to another monotheistic tradition called the body politic. And that statement will piss off more people than you know. Why? Because the determination of the quality of their existence is entirely formulated with regards to how rigidly they apply the dogma of the ideology. Worse yet, in their failings, they would attempt to foist it upon others and pass judgment upon them. The scars of thousands of years of religion are readily apparent amongst these good people. Many people will fall victim to a one-two punch of a religion coupled with a political ideal, the conservative Republican. And everything seems well in their world. And yet I have counseled many people who find themselves at a crossroads in life of immense pain, where the unholy combination of the two serves them no comfort or reassurance or even a suitable platform to fall back on. They find themselves seemingly lost. And that's where people make that decision to change the foundation of their spiritual belief. They're right back at the beginning of where they were, probably where they should be. The real question is, have they learned that lesson? Have they got that answer to make a sound quality decision as to how they want their spiritual life to reflect upon and help form their physical plane. Now that's a wild statement, but you got to remember the original question. Does their goodwill proceed from their own nature? Or do the divine powers they worship ordain such things? The entire, if you look at all of the tale of the prose edda, and I will go through all of it and the poetic edda, and I've in, indeed I've done much of it already in life and the love of life and a drink from him as well. <sighs> again and again, we are told in the lore that these individuals that follow a certain path, that understand these flows of energy, that understand what the runes stand for, these symbols of power and the keys to the universe. They go on to become something much, much more. Not because a god has come down and give them the little blessing or cross on the forehead or touch them on the shoulder, but because they have done the hard work of sacrificing those aspects of themselves that shed those most painful constructs of our own thought processes, our, our resentments, our hates, our shortcomings, all of those things that we would point out in other people that we carry about ourselves. Most of the time when I hear people talk about dragging that baggage down the road of life, I more often envision them pull it, pushing a construct of, that they have themselves made in front of them. It's time to let some of that stuff go. And the great fear in all of that, when we're trying to rectify this new and wild and and, and way of life that is larger than many of us can begin to imagine or more powerful than we can than we believe we can put into effect <laughs> is what will I become if I let go of that? Will I still be important if I don't say those kinds of things 
that these other people come and give a like on my Facebook page? Will I still be me if I cease to hate this, that, or the other? If I cease to, if I start to understand that what they're doing over there really has no effect on me and how I build the world I want to live in and how I enable and enact and support and reassure the people around me, including my children, the members of the various kindreds across this world that I work with, and the people that, that look at me and call me a gothi, that read my books. I can point out bad things all day long. But the key thing in all of this, when I ask people to proceed of their own nature, is that they identify what that nature might really be. It is your own nature what's poisoning the well, the roots of your own tree. And that's what we're going to go with on this next. When the Norns refresh those roots that fall in the dale every morning, <laughs> after Nidhogg the dragon gnaws at the roots all day, that gnawing doubt that slows us down, that stops us, that that concerns us, that creates fear within us, that creates doubt. Will they love me? Will they care for me? What if I let go of this? These people over here won't think as much of me as they do now. So what? Not one iota of what they think about you is going to change your eye color or your hair color or a single cell of your being. In fact, you might be able to look at the world in a little bit brighter way. <laughs> this book that I'm writing blind, I mean, it's it's coming along real nice. Uh, I've got I've got three or four chapters, but in the end of it, the goal of this is to get people to get out of their own minds and the thinking processes which have hindered them from becoming something more, from loving the people around them, from developing that relationship with themselves based upon a quality understanding of who and what they are, an evaluation of the gifts these gods have given us so that we might join them at the table at some time in the future. Who knows when that might be? We might even be able to do it now. It says Cone Rig can do it when he fought for and earned the right to become Rig, when Odin sacrificed himself to himself, when we become responsible for ourselves to ourselves. There's some amazing things that happen. There's some powerful growths that happen physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. We become new people, and it is okay to do that. And I don't think anyone's given anybody permission to become something more. Well, right now in this book, and so what I've written, you have permission to become something much more than you currently are. Not because I'm trying to be right, but because I believe that you have what it takes to do it. So go out there and give it hell.